Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking you through one of the very fundamental um, tasks involved in pretty much any dynamics problem, which is first identifying forces and drawing free body diagrams, but then, more importantly, decomposing those forces so that we can properly add them up in order to use them in Newton's second law, which says that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times the acceleration. So the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And remember, that's a vector equation. So we're going to be seeing exactly how all that comes together um, as we go through this problem. So the first part is that we've got this ball, which is on two inclines over there. And they've got two different angles. And we just need to draw and label all the forces that are acting on the ball. So let's come over here and put a ball. There's always right, gravity. That's our go-to force. So that's the force of the Earth acting on the ball straight down. Then we've got the force from plane one acting on the ball. And we've got a force from incline two acting on the ball. Why no friction? Well, because it's in equilibrium. It's just sitting there doing nothing. It's clearly balanced at that little lowest point. So there's no friction. Similarly, no air resistance, because again, it's just sitting there. Okay, so it's placed at the meeting point. It's not doing anything. We know it's not accelerating because it's perfectly balanced. So these are all the forces that we need to think about. So that's the first question done. That's pretty straightforward. So then what can we do? Well, we look at the next question, which says, tell me the magnitude of this force in terms of just FEB, the angles involved in the problem, and uh, use those angles and just this force to describe the magnitude of F1B. So that sounds a bit tricky, perhaps, but it won't be if we just carefully decompose these things and work on those forces. So let's start off with that decomposition and then see where we end up, uh, and that'll guide us along our way. To do the decomposition, we have to be pretty careful. So let's think about this um, incline, say incline 2. So there it is. That is the angle theta 2, uh, theta sub 2, I should say. So that's the angle theta 2. And there's some normal force coming from that. And that's the one that we've drawn there. But which angle corresponds to theta 2 in order for us to decompose this? And furthermore, how are we decomposing this? So actually, normally when we're talking about these kind of things with just one plane, uh, with one incline, we know that the motion is in the plane and the force is clearly perpendicular to the plane. So that incline sets a very nice choice of coordinate systems and you might have said, that'll be my y and down the slope potentially it will be my x. And then you didn't have to decompose anything. But that was because the motion was actually in the plane and the force was perpendicular and you had to decompose only gravity. You can see if I choose this coordinate system, I still have to decompose also this other force here. So no matter what I choose, I'm going to have to decompose two things. And rather than work in this weird rotated coordinate system, which then means I need to sort of double rotate to get to the other plane, because then I have to think about theta 1 and theta 2 at the same time, I'm just going to decompose in coordinates where gravity is set so that I just think about this is inclined by theta 2 with respect to that, and the other incline is inclined by theta 1 with respect to that choice. So I'm not going to use the coordinates of the plane because there is no motion. So either way, I have to decompose two things. And if I start trying to decompose this force from 2 in terms of coordinates that are aligned with the force from 1, then I have to work out what this kind of angle is, and that's a bit complicated. And I don't feel like doing that. So I'm just going to decompose this in coordinates where I'm calling that my x and that my y. So looking over here, I need to still figure out where this angle theta 2 goes in order to decompose this into something which looks like a bit to the left and a bit up. 
So I've drawn a triangle. It's really tempting for me to take this angle and put it there and say that that's theta 2. But if you remember the little tricks that you learn in maths class, if you've got two parallel lines and you've got something cutting between them, then the interior angles, alternate interior angles, are the same. So this angle and this angle are actually the same. So that's theta 2, which means that this one, because this is the normal to this surface, so this is a 90 degree angle here, so this big thing is a 90 degree angle, means that this little angle is actually 90 minus theta 2. So that makes this one theta 2 because that's also 90 over there. And the sum of the angles of a triangle are 180. So you've got 90 plus 90 minus theta 2, which means that's theta 2. All right, so there's theta 2. Similarly, that will be theta 1. So we can now just use Sokotoa to go ahead and get our components. So looking at this triangle here, this is certainly the hypotenuse, F2B. This component down here is opposite to the angle. So you know, perhaps kind of um, counterintuitive way, this becomes the sine of theta 2. You might have thought it should have been cosine, because normally the things on the x-axis are, but it's because of the way that we're actually orienting things. So theta 2 ended up there, so that's F2B sine theta 2. And this one is F2B cosine of theta 2. And you can see from the same kind of argument that really this side is F1B um, cosine of theta 1, and this one's F1B, sorry, F1B of sine theta 1 is that side and that side, and this whole thing is F1B. So that's our decomposition done. So now we want to describe F1B all in terms of FEB, theta 1, and theta 2. Well, the only thing that involves FEB is all the Y components. And we've already said at the start of this that the ball is just sitting there. It's at rest. So if it's at rest, then and it's not accelerating, there's no forces, it's in equilibrium, then the sum of the forces is zero. So that's telling us, right, that's a vector equation. It's telling us that the sum of the forces in the x and in the y are going to be zero. So let's look at this equation just in the x direction. So that says the sum of the, I mean, sorry, in the y direction, because that's where we've got FEB. So the sum of the forces in the y are zero. Okay. What are the sum of the forces in the y? Well, there's a positive F2B cosine theta here, a positive F1B there, and a negative FEB, because that's going down. So we'd write F1B cos theta 1 plus F2B cos theta 2 minus FE b equals 0. All right, so FEB combined with all these others gives us this equation in the x direction, uh, in the y direction, sorry. So that almost looks promising because I can certainly do, I can take the FEB to the other side, take F2B to the other side, divide by cosine theta 1. So F1B is FEB, I made that gigantic, FEB. Uh, then I was doing minus F2B cosine of theta 2, and I'm dividing by cosine of theta 1. So that is an expression for F1B in terms of FEB, theta 1 and theta 2, which is what we want, but unfortunately F2B is in there. So we'd like to get rid of that dependence. So we need another equation, and fortunately, we've already got it on the board. It's hiding right there. So we'll do that in the x direction. So let's erase and create some space. We'll leave our answer for F1B for a moment. 
but we'll erase that equation and look at what we can do in the other direction. So this time, actually in the x direction, some of the forces in the x is again zero, it's not moving. So what are the x forces? This time there's only two. They are the forces, or the components, of the forces from the inclines. So in the positive x direction, we got F1b sine theta. In the negative, we got F2b sine theta 2. So F1b um, sine theta 1. It would have been plus because we're adding all the forces, but it's in the negative direction. So it's minus F2b sine theta 2 is equal to 0. So we can use this now to solve for F2b to get rid of it in the other equation. So F2b, you put that on the other side, would have been F1b sine of theta 1 divided by sine of theta 2. Okay, so we can put that into this expression down here. So that is going to equal FEB minus F1B sine theta 1 divided by the sine of theta 2 times the cosine of theta 2 all divided by the cosine of theta 1. All right, so this is the expression that we finally ended up with. And clearly, we have some work to do because we've got F1b on both sides. So let's start manipulating this a bit of F1b. So we've got, let's put everything on common denominator so that it'll be easier to manipulate a bit. So there'll be an FEB. I'll put the sine theta two as common to everything. So then I have cosine theta one, sine theta two. And I'll have still here the minus F one B sine theta one cos theta two. All right. Running over the script there, so we'll move a bit to the left in our next line. So we're going to go and say F1b multiplying over cosine of theta 1 sine of theta 2 is all of this stuff. FEb sine theta 2. And you can see where we're headed. We're going to put this F1b term to the other side, sine theta 1 cosine theta 2. So move this to the other side. We'll factor out the F1b and divide back by everything. So F1b cosine theta 1, I'll do it in two steps, sine theta 2 plus, when I bring it to the other side, sine theta 1 cos theta 2 is equal to FEB sine theta 2. So then, we can now keep going. So we divided both sides by this term in brackets here. And finally, we have an answer which looks pretty monstrous. And remember, the last part of a problem is always to think about what your uh, answer suggests. So I don't know about you but this doesn't look very intuitive at all to me. So how can I make this into something that I can think about intuitively and see if it has any chance of being correct? Um, so let me just move this closer here. Make it a bit clearer. Sine theta 1 cos theta 2. Good, so that fits now on this page. All right, um, 
So how do I think about this? That's the real question. How can I possibly do anything with this really bizarre expression? Well, instead of staring at the expression, let's think about the problem and see if we can come up with some cases where we know what the answers should be. So it's given it to us in terms of general angle, and supposedly this answer we have is completely general then, because we've left the angles completely free. They can be whatever they like, theta 1 and theta 2. So let's think about some cases where we know what the answer would be. So suppose theta 1 is some arbitrary angle theta 1, but I want to think about that theta 2 is actually 0. So that corresponds to this kind of picture, and the ball is just sitting there. It's touching incline 1, but incline 1 actually doesn't have to apply any force. It's just pushing down from gravity on this um, thing, and there's this normal force up, and the normal force up balances the force of gravity. All right, I, don't, I can move this away, and nothing's going to happen. It's actually resting on incline 2, even though it touches incline 1. So in this case, I would expect that F1 is actually 0, and because F2b, which we haven't worked out, is supposed to be actually Feb, because it completely balances. So there's nothing left for F1b to do. So that's theta2 is equal to 0. If theta2 is equal to 0, well, sine of 0 is 0. So the denominator is safe because there's a sine of theta1 theta one and cosine theta2. So cosine theta2 is non-zero. Sine of 0 is 1. So we're left with cosine theta2, 0 upstairs. So f1b is 0. So that works. We've got one case where we know that this formula at least gives us the right answer. Another similar case that we can quickly check is the opposite case, where f1b should equal feb. Because now, if we make theta 1, 0, in this case, that's what we've done, this has to be true, there should be balancing, and it's this second incline that I can take away and have nothing happen as the ball is sitting there, and it's touching the second incline, but it's resting really only on the first. So if we think about that, well, that's theta 1 is 0. So sine of theta 2 stays. Cosine of 0 is in this case, becomes 1. The sine of theta 2 stays. The sine of theta 1 is 0. So that wipes out that whole second term. And we're just left with Feb sine theta 2 on sine theta 2. So and again, because uh, these two cancel then, we're just left with Feb. So these two limiting cases seem to be working. So we have at least some hope that our formula in this problem is actually correct. So that's one way that we can think about this complicated mess and realize that things are working as expected. So the general formula is this thing without all the stuff crossed out. So it's Feb sine theta 2 on the product of mix and matching cosines and sines. Um, and that will actually describe what this force from the one incline is. Okay. So we've now successfully answered the question and hopefully understood a little bit um, better how we're doing decompositions and how we take these vector sums to really apply F equals MA. Just like with projectile motion, the trick is that you treat the directions separately and then add them up. Hopefully that was helpful. We'll look at other questions in other videos.